Open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 47. We are going through a study here on the life of Joseph, and now we've come to a big scene where Joseph's family, Israel, also known as Jacob, is coming down from Canaan into the land of Egypt, and they're going to meet Pharaoh, live in the land of Goshen. And what God is doing here, God is moving his little people group, this little family of 70 people. They are in this land, and then God will raise them up 400 years later, preparing for the exodus. So glad you're able to join us this evening here at Broadway Baptist Church. Uh, we go through on Sunday nights the sermon series on the life of Joseph. And it's a powerful one. And tonight's main, main point that I think that God's speaking to you and I is that we don't write our endings. Jacob did not have the opportunity to pick how he's going to die, where he's going to die, the circumstances of his death. We're going to see Jacob, the patriarch, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, spending the last 17 years of his life in the land of Egypt. Powerful passage. I know it reminds us that God holds our life in his hands. Every day is a day of trusting in the Lord. And you should be able to look back on your life and see how God has led you to where you're at. You want to be content to where you're at. And wherever you're at, in whatever city, whatever country, you want to be used by the Lord. The great thing about our God is we can wake up every day and say, God, I am yours. My mouth is your mouth. My hands are your hands. How can I serve you? Can I make a phone call? Can I send an email? Can I write a card, a note of encouragement to let someone else know that, that I'm thinking of them, that I prayed for them, that they are in my thoughts. I tell you, they, that is such a powerful way of just ministering and encouraging other people. Do you know this uh, unique time that we're in? We're, we're in the Rebuild series here at our church. We just wrapped it up this morning, and that's our theme for our year. In many ways, we're rebuilding Broadway Baptist Church we're rebuilding our lives. We're rebuilding our nation. Lots of brokenness, a lot of job loss, a lot of folks who are hurting, a lot of marriages hurting. And we are in a series and a time that we need to trust in the Lord. So I'm certainly inviting you and encouraging you to do that. One other thing I want to let you know about, we have baptism in a couple of weeks here at Broadway. If you are interested in receiving believer's baptism, we're actually going to do it on Valentine's Day. No better day to express your love for Jesus. If you want to get baptized on that day, you need to let me know. Just fill out our connection card. Give me a call. Some, shoot, shoot me an email. I'd love to talk to you about what it means of following Christ in obedience and taking those steps in a commitment to the Lord for that. Open up your Bibles here. Genesis chapter 47, powerful passage here about Pharaoh and Jacob meeting. Pharaoh is the most powerful man in the world. Joseph is the second hand, right-hand man to Pharaoh. Joseph is the favorite son of Jacob. It says here, So Joseph went and informed Pharaoh, My father, my brothers, with their flocks and herds and all that they own, have come from the land of Canaan, are now in the land of Goshen. The land of Goshen, remember that is in the northeast part of Egypt. And what's unique about the land of Goshen, this is where, it's also in the Bible called the land of Ramesses, this is where all the Israelites are going to live for 400 years, and they're going to multiply in over a million. And then all of a sudden, God is going to allow that group to lead through the Red Sea into the Promised Land. Moses is going to lead them out. So that's our context of where we're at. It says he took five of his brothers. And I think it's interesting. Now remember, he had, he had 11 brothers. Remember, J Joseph is 11 of 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, he only brings five of them to present in front of Pharaoh. Why five? The reason why I believe five, and maybe other Bible scholars certainly uh, as well, as I was researching this, is because he didn't want it to feel overwhelming to Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't need to feel threatened as all of a sudden these men start showing up. you got 11 boys here with daddy. 
wanting to move into Egypt, thinking these folks aren't Egyptians. Who are these people? Even though he, uh, Jacob is my right-hand man, we don't want to intimidate. We don't want to do any, cause any harm to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a lost, wicked man. But he also trusts in Joseph because Joseph has such superior leadership skills. God has entrusted and given Joseph wisdom and understanding on how to provide, not just for Egypt, but supply for all the other people. This, the, the wealth Egypt is accumulating is unbelievable. And we're about to see some incredible business principles as we go on here in this chapter to see how God used Joseph in this. It says in verse 3, And Pharaoh asked his brothers, What is your occupation? Now remember, Joseph prepped, prepped him, them for this. What's your occupation? Because this was an important question. Pharaoh did not want to feel threatened. They said to Pharaoh, Your servants... Both we and our ancestors are shepherds. Egyptians despised shepherds. That was considered a very lowly job. They just looked down upon that. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to stay in the land for a while because there is no grazing land for your servant sheep. Since with the famine in the land in Canaan has been severe, so now please let your servants settle in the land of Goshen. They're saying, remember, Goshen is just barely in Egypt. It's at the very northwestern, northeastern part of Egypt, near the Del Nile, Nile River Delta. It's where you can easily raise some crops there. Good fertilization, great place to uh, uh, be a farmer, to be a shepherd, so your animals can graze, have plenty of, plenty of water to drink. And they're asking for this, for this special land to say, we're, just barely, we're not going to be near the capital, you won't see of us. We're just going to be over here in the corner. It's kind of like here in the United States, Goshen would be like Maine. Here we are in Kentucky. Someone comes to us, or say we were in Washington, and someone comes and said, hey, look, I just want to bring my family, and we just want some, a few acres, some property up there in Maine. It's cold. It's in the far corner. There's just a lot of trees. I've never even been to Maine. Who goes to Maine? All I think of Maine is lobster. I mean, it's just like kind of that's the area, probably a very beautiful area to visit during the summertime. Uh, really, really uh, New England uh, charm up there. But it's not, not really a place we go to. Most folks in Frankfurt, most folks in Washington aren't really concerned about Maine. So that's kind of what Goshen is like. That's the area they're talking about. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, now that your father and brothers have come to you, the land of Egypt is open before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. They can live in the land of Goshen. If you know of any capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. I love this quote here. Even what's happening is Pharaoh recognizes even my Egyptians, they don't want to be shepherds. They don't want to take care of my livestock. And I keep accumulating all this stuff because everybody's coming to me. I've got, I have a need here. And Joseph's brothers, his 11 brothers, were able to actually not only raise their own livestock, but they were raising the livestock of Pharaoh. So that, there, was a tr there was an exchange there. Pharaoh said, yeah, you can come live in my land. I, in fact, need some shepherds. Uh, will you watch my livestock as well, if that's what you're going to do? So I'm sure thousands more animals came. So not only are they raising their own livestock, they're raising the uh, Pharaohs as well. Joseph then brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. You know, this is powerful. Pharaoh is a lost man. We as Christians, even when an unbeliever shows us kindness, mercy, extends grace to us, we need to show appreciation and bless them. You know, God has created all people in His image. Even though a lot of folks aren't Christians, even though they don't believe like we do, Jacob realized God is using this man here, Pharaoh, to save my family. Even though we're the chosen nation, even though God has a great plan for Israel and all His sons, 
Pharaoh is the one that's giving him a temporary home here in the land of Goshen and allowing him to be reunited with his sons, especially the son there of Joseph. He thought Joseph was dead. Jacob will live in Egypt for 17 years. The Israelites are going to remain in the land of Goshen for 400 years. Many of them probably thought, we're just going to be here for a couple of years, and then we're going back to Canaan, going back to the promised land. But that was not at all. Um, a short vacation, an extended vacation, ended up being a generational move. 400 years ago, think how old that's. America's not. If we went back 400 years, we'd be 1621. That would be, we would be living in the time of the pilgrims. We'd be looking at out Boston Harbor, the Mayflower, and looking at Plymouth Rock. That's how long they were there. And so we read history and we forget how much of a time period we're talking about right here. So the principle I think we see is God is, God is allowing Jacob to bless Pharaoh. And I think we're to do the same. The Bible does tell us to do it. Who do you know that you need? Maybe they're not a believer. Maybe they have Egyptian values, which are just lost values, cultural values of Lexington. But you still need to extend a blessing to them because they have expressed kindness. They've given you encouragement. Joseph then brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh blessed and Jacob blessed him. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many years have you lived? That's because Jacob is an old man. You know, whenever you see an old man, you always, you're always tempted to say, well, Sir, how old are you? You know, I, Sherry, I, I'm not a big TV fan. Sherry uh, watches, I guess, different movies and stuff. But um, years ago, there used to be this show called The Golden Girls. And one of the ladies is named Betty White. And she turned 99 years old. And according to Sherry Osmond, she's still acting. Now, whether or not the woman's still acting... I don't know, but the fact that she's 99 years old and Sherry says she's still shooting commercials and, and videos and appearing briefly in movies. And I think the principle is when you see somebody who's 99 and they're still on TV, they're still working away, you just want to walk up to them and say, ma'am, how old are you? I can't believe it. You're 99 years old and you're still working away. I mean, just like here in our church, last month, well, our oldest church member celebrated her 101st birthday, 101. Every time you see Miss Catherine, you want to say, are you 101 years old? I know she listens to these broadcasts here. We, we mail, her the, mail her the CDs. And I think the principle of that is, that's what Pharaoh is seeing. He's seeing this elderly man, Jacob, come, show up, and he says, well, sir, how old are you? Jacob said to Pharaoh, my pilgrimage has lasted 130 years old. That's, he's getting on up there, 130 years old. My years have been few and hard, and they have not reached the years of my ancestors during their pilgrimages. Abraham lived 180 years. So he knew, hey, my, my grandfather still hasn't been beat by 50 years. Now this is in the back post-flood. These are the long, these patriarchs are living a long time. These are some of the longest lives after the flood that we see folks living. Now we know Methuselah lived 969 years, but that's pre-flood. After the flood, people did not live long, uh, the long, as long. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and departed from Pharaoh's presence. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers in the land of Egypt and gave them property in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's family with food for their dependents. That's why they were there. Pharaoh is providing them with food. God has raised up Joseph to help give Pharaoh guidance and wisdom on how to manage the crisis that they're in. And not only that, the brothers there are also shepherding and raising Pharaoh's livestock. So this is kind of a transactional me. I'll give you some land. You give us some food. We'll take care of your animals. I've got your son here managing all of Egypt. We're all, we're all benefiting from each other. And that's how the best, in many ways, business transactions work. It's a win-win-win for everybody. Everybody gives some, everyone receives something. And Joseph provided his father, his brother, and all his father's family with food for their dependents. 
But there was no food in the entire region of the famine, and it was very severe. The land of Egypt and the land of Canaan were exhausted by the famine, so times are getting worse. Remember, this is a seven-year famine. When we say famine, we're talking no rain. We're recording this here on a day where it has rained all day long. And, I mean, just you can look out the window, you can, where you're driving around, you can just see water literally everywhere. That was not the case. It was dry, it was hot, it was dusty, it's miserable, and everybody's thirsty. I mean, you just, it's those days you just look at the ground, and even the rivers, the creeks, the ponds, they've all dried up. And you think, gosh, we are desperate for rain. The crops are dying. But remember, they had seven good years, and they stored up their grain under Joseph's leadership. Joseph collected all the silver to be found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain they were purchasing. And he brought the silver to Pharaoh's palace. So what was happening is all the people kept coming to Pharaoh, and they were, they were buying their grain with silver. But the silver is about to run out. Joseph has collected all the silver. I mean, there's no silver left in the land. So understand, Egypt has become wealthy. And it says here, When the silver from the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan was gone, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die here in front of you? The silver is gone, so they're recognizing we don't have any silver left. What do we do? We're starving. What, do we just stand here and die? You're the only hope for saving humanity in this whole region. But Joseph said, give me your livestock. Since the silver is gone, I will give you food in exchange for your livestock. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and he gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks of sheep, the herds, the cattle, the donkeys. That year he provided them with food in exchange for all their livestock. So now the money is run out. So the next step here is we're paying with our cattle. We're paying with our animals. So they're trading in. Probably a lot of those animals are end up in Goshen because you know, that's where uh, Jacob and his family were. They're starting to care for everybody's animals. So Pharaoh's just taking these animals and sending them up to Goshen so that they can, um, they can, they can live. When that year was over, so we just keep on going, the, the times are going from bad to worse to worse. When that year was over, they came in the next year, they said to him, We cannot hide from our Lord that the silver is gone, or our livestock belongs to our Lord, that's the Pharaoh. There is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. So they realized all I have left is me and my land. What's interesting about this is, we won't turn there, but I want to tell you, in Leviticus 25, Verses 39 through 43. The Bible gives the Israelites permission to actually, if they are in desperation, if they are in times where extreme poverty and they're impoverished, they can sell themselves as slavery. What that means is, is understand they're fighting death. When they don't have any, they can submit themselves to being a slave in exchange for food. And that's what we're about to see right here. Slavery in the Old Testament was a reality. And it says, verse 19, Why should we die here in front of you, both us and our land? Buy us and our land in exchange for food. Then we with our land will become Pharaoh's slaves. Give us seed so we can live and not die, and so that the land won't become desolate. It says they're seeds. They're talking about grain. Like, give us bread. Give us food to eat. We're giving ourselves. We, I will become your slave. You can have my land. It's either you take us and our land or we die because there's no food. This is just ultimate desperation. You cannot get a more desperate picture than this. This is truly, you're at the end of the rope. There's no safety nets here. And Joseph made the people servants from one end of Egypt to the other. The only land he did not acquire belonged to the priest. For they had an allowance from Pharaoh. They ate from their allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. And these are Egyptian priests. So these would be priests of, of, of Egypt. These would, priests would not be worshipers of the Lord. At harvest, you are to give a fifth of it to, your, to Pharaoh, and four-fifths will be yours, a seed for your field, 
and as for food for yourselves, your households, and your dependents. Now, I want to explain what's going on here. Um, Pharaoh and Joseph, they did not want to literally take the land. What they wanted is they wanted the deed and the title to the land. They wanted the paperwork saying, I own that piece of property. But you, you're still going to live on it. You're still going to farm the land. You might not get to farm now because of the drought, but when this ends, I am going to allow you to remain on that land, this Egyptian land. It's your land, or it's my land. You live on it with your family. You grow crops and grain. I get 20%. You keep 80%. So the people thought, well, we'll take that. Because basically what's happening is I'm allowed to stay on my property that I used to own, now it's Pharaoh's. It's still my home. It's still my, my land that I've always lived on. But I now just have to give 20% of everything I grow to Pharaoh. This is a great business principle. This makes Pharaoh very wealthy. And this principle continued on for centuries in Egyptian history. God raised up Joseph and gave him wisdom, saying, don't, don't, don't literally take the people's land and don't take it all. You just let them live on your land now, and they pay 20%, and they get to keep 80%. So that's, that's the picture we see here of what's going on. But remember, they're not able to farm now because there's no, um, there's no water. There's, there's such a famine. There's such a drought. It's terrible times. So they're eating Joseph's food that he has stored up to stay alive. And they're waiting for the famine to end. Verse 25, You've saved our lives, they said. We have found favor with our Lord and will be Pharaoh's slaves. So the Egyptian people like this deal. They realize we can, we'll give you 20% and I'll keep 80%. So Joseph made it a law, still in effect today in the land of Egypt. And that phrase, still in effect today, meant even when Moses wrote this five, four or five hundred years later, that principle, you keep four-fifths, Egypt owns it, Pharaoh gets 20%. It still, it still uh, was applied during that day, during the time Moses wrote Genesis 47. Four-fifths of the, uh, a fifth of that produce belongs to Pharaoh. Only the priest's land does not belong to Pharaoh. So I think we see incredible wisdom. One of the spiritual gifts is wisdom, and God has give, given Joseph this wisdom. One of the great things we also see about this passage here is Joseph is standing in the gap for Egypt. He's saving all the people. Even though all the people are becoming slaves and they're turning over all their land to, to Pharaoh, they're saving their lives. In many ways, that's an analogy, that's a story for the same for Jesus. Jesus stands in the gap for us. Joseph is doing what Jesus is, did in the New Testament. Jesus came to say, hey, you all are lost. I am the bread of life. You trust in me, you can be saved. You turn to me, I will provide you with food. But the difference is, Pharaoh wanted 20%. He wanted 20% of all their... Jesus wants everything from us. When you trust in Christ as your Savior, you become a complete disciple and follower of Him. And Jesus Christ calls us 100% to follow the Lord. Are you following the Lord? Here we are at the last day of January. Are you still in your devotional life this month? Are you still fulfilling your commitment that you've made? Are you still praying for your, our new president? Are you praying for our nation? Are you praying for opportunities for evangelism and outreach? Are you looking for God to use your mouth and your hands for him? And I just see, I think we see an incredible picture of Joseph. God has given this man wisdom not to just lord over and just destroy the people, he just asked for you, look, you, you stay on the land. You keep 80%. I just want 20. I have Because when it came down to it, Pharaoh had no desire to start becoming a farmer. He wanted to live in a palace in Cairo. He, he, had, you know, he was a, he's a king. He's not concerned about their animals. He just wants money. 
just send me, just send me your 20%. I own, and his attitude was, I own everything. Look at verse 27 here. Now Jacob is preparing to die. He's concerned because he's in a foreign land, and he's realizing, I didn't get the plan. This is how we don't write our own ending. You don't get to write your own ending. We have no idea what our future holds for us. We daily trust the Lord. You can try to maneuver and position yourself, but ultimately God holds the ending. Verse 27, Israel settled in the land of Egypt. In the region of Goshen, they acquired property in it and became very fruitful and numerous. God is blessing the Israelites, this young little family, this clan. They're up in that land of Goshen, and the Lord is just allowing them to be very fruitful. That means their family is multiplying. They, they aren't experiencing uh, the ravages of the famine, maybe as other places are. Now Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years, and his lifespan was 147 years, a long time. So he spent 17 years. He went there 130 and he went there riding in a wagon, in a cart, an Egyptian cart. And he's remaining in this land with the purpose of what God is going to basically close his eyes. He will never go back to the land of Canaan. When the time approached for him to die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor with you, put your hand under my thigh and promise me that you will deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt. So there's a promise that Jacob wants from his son Joseph. He says, son, I'm about to die, but this is not my land. The promised land is in Canaan, where I came from. I want you to take me back, my bones, and bury me. That was very common. Jewish people, they would take someone, they would bury them, and then a year or two later, they would then go back after the body decomposed, they would take those bones, and then they would do a final burial. That's how they did it during Bible times. That's why Jesus, they would have a tomb for someone that you would roll away a stone because typically they knew in a year or two after, the, after it decayed, after the body would decay, you would come back and gra gather the bones and do a, put them in a final resting place. And that was originally what was intended with Jesus, except Jesus, uh, third day he was resurrected with that. So um, that's what Jacob is saying here. And the reason why he said, put under my thigh, that means he's drawing him in close. He's saying, son, this is serious. It's a trust factor. I want you to know I'm about to go and be gathered with my fathers. And I want you to honor me by bringing my bones back to where they go. When I rest with my ancestors, carry me away from Egypt and bury me in their burial place. Joseph answered, I will do what you have asked. Joseph is honoring his father. And Jacob said, Swear to me. So Joseph swore to him. Then Israel bowed in thanks at the head of his bed. So obviously at this point, he's probably a struggle for him to even get up. He's bed, uh, bed, uh, bedridden, homebound. Jacob, the father, the patriarch, the swindler, the one who is a, a deceiver, here he is at the very end of his life. And his son Joseph is providing good care. Joseph has really emerged as the leader here of their family. Joseph is the prime minister. At this point, this is 17 years later. The famine's now over with. Egypt is booming. Pharaoh is incredibly wealthy under Joseph's leadership. I think the biblical principle we see here is we are reminded that when you have to go to Egypt, God brought them down to Egypt, but they did not accept Egyptian values and beliefs. They were in their own land of Goshen. They had to go there to stay alive, but they were only planned there for being a short time. That short time ended up being 400 years. In our life, many times we have to go down, and we're in a place that maybe you, it's your work, your school, uh, your um, maybe just where you live here in Lexington, and you look around and go, everything's so different. 
Maybe you grew up in the country. You grew up in a small town with small town biblical values where, where church was the community. You were literally raised in church. Everything you did. And now you're living in Big Blue Nation. You're living here in the bluegrass in a big city. And you're thinking, this is different. This is not what I'm used to. This is Egypt. And what God is calling you and I to do, even though we might live, even though we do live in a city that does not maybe respect biblical values, we as Christians, we do not adapt and we do not live according to the values of our day. And if you are doing that, you need to stop and say, why, why am I becoming worldly? Why am I watching this stuff? Why am I talking like this? Why am I thinking and adapting these values that I know go directly against the Scriptures? That is what jo Jacob was worried about. He was leaving the promised land. The security, the God that had called him, the God there that says, I will make you in a great nation. You're going to have 12 sons. The God that re renamed him Israel, the God that wrestled with him at night before he went and met his son, his brother Esau. That's Jacob. And he's reassuring him, saying, this isn't my land here in Egypt. I had to live in Egypt, but it's not my home. And I think for us, eternally, many of you, you might love America. We do love America. We're proud to be Americans. But America is not our home. Our home and our citizenship is in heaven. We live for the Lord. We live for an eternal home with Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Is Jesus Christ your Savior? Have you trusted in Him? Are you living for this world you're in? I want to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus. Maybe you're like Jacob, and you're realizing, look, I've got to spend 17 years here. My last days... I don't get to write them. God wrote the ending of Jacob's life. If you want to get saved, you can do that. You trust in Jesus, and you know your ending is actually in His hands. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. If you want to trust in Christ as your Savior, you pray along with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Lord, I trust in you. Lord, I ask for your guidance. Lord, wherever you lead, I'll go. Lord, you guide my steps. Jesus, I'm yours. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed and received Jesus, fill out that online connection card. Shoot us an email here. Send us a Message on our church Facebook page. Give me a call. Let us know your commitment you've made. And I'll let you know about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. You can get baptized as well in a couple of weeks here at Broadway on Valentine's Day. God bless you. I hope you come here every Sunday evening and participate in our online study. In our Facebook live study. In our podcast studies, we're going through the life of Joseph, a, a life that for us is an example in 2021. God bless you. I'll see you next month and next week as well.